There comes a time in every player's career when how effective they are isn't the only question being asked, but how much time will they still be able to maintain that same level of production? Unless you're Tom Brady, who's reached alien god mode at this point, age is gonna catch up with you. And in front offices and fantasy football front offices alike, predicting when a player's effectiveness will start plummeting off the cliff is absolutely critical. Teams are terrified of hanging on to aging, expensive assets for too long, since you could go from having an elite player to all of a sudden having nothing. When players turn 30, that's when people usually start worrying since it's historically when production begins to slip. But for the all-timers, especially at the receiver position, that's when their greatness begins to separate them. Jerry Rice, Randy Moss, T.O., Marvin Harrison, Larry Fitzgerald, many of the best seemingly stop time and produce some of their greatest seasons after they turn 30. And for Julio Jones, who's now 32, his career thus far has been record-breaking, but now it's time to see how long he can stretch out his greatness. Julio's been on the trading block for the past several months for a variety of reasons, not just due to his age, but whether he stays with the Falcons or actually does get traded, whichever team he plays for, they'll have to ask themselves, is he still that good or is he starting to slow down at 32? Injuries have always been an issue both last year and throughout his career, and in 2020 he played just nine games due to a bum hamstring. But despite the narrative surrounding those injury issues, he'd only missed four games since 2014 prior to this year. While his production totals weren't at those usual elite levels due to that time missed, he was actually the most efficient he's been in years, and in several areas, his entire career. His QB rating when targeted was 7th in the league and his highest in the last three seasons. His yards per route run was 3rd, and his yards per target was also 3rd and the highest he's ever produced. Pair all that with his 75% catch rate, which was also the best of his career, and Julio's 2020 was arguably the most efficient he's been ever. You can tell just by turning on the tape what NFL defenses think of certain players by how many resources they're allocating to stop them. Even at 32, with that hamstring bothering him during games, defenses still regularly deploy bracket coverage or double teams on Julio, which is a major reason his teammate Calvin Ridley exploded in 2020. There are certain routes Julio runs that teams have to game plan to stop, and even when they do, he still burns them on him. One of those routes is called the drift route, which depending on how it's coached is either a 5 or 6 step quick dig breaking inside. It's usually paired with play action to suck up the linebackers to create space over the middle, and teams are petrified of Julio catching this on the run and taking it to the house. Teams are so scared of him running these drift routes, they'll cheat defenders out of their typical assignments to shut down this route, which frequently creates one-on-one -on -one matchups for Ridley, Russell Gage, and the rest of the Falcons' receivers. On just the second play of the game, that's exactly what the Falcons call, and the Saints counter with cover one man, which has one deep safety. If Matt Ryan can get the linebackers to charge forward on the play fake, Julio will be wide open up the middle, assuming the free safety sitting in his usual deep middle zone. But since the Saints are so scared of the drift route, the safety completely vacates his position to trap it, much to Ryan's surprise. So he turns to Ridley, who has the leverage advantage over the middle, and hits him deep down the field. The Saints even went so far as to have both their safety and their corner jump the route. Watch how Patrick Robinson undercuts Julio when he breaks inside, but Ryan's too good to throw it into traffic. When defenses are selling out to stop one specific route, good offenses will find ways to exploit that. So then two weeks later, when the teams meet again, the Falcons line up in a similar formation, but now use a wrinkle based on film study to get Julio free. The Saints know they just got burned on the drift, deep post concept a few weeks before, and know they're going to see it again. So they drop a second safety back to stay over the top of Ridley while maintaining the double on Julio. But knowing the safety's there to jump the drift route, Julio gets both defenders to buy the fake, then just spins out into the open field. This was a brilliant route and a brilliant play call, but also took a little veteran gamesmanship on Julio's part to make it work. When we go back to that first play, right when Ryan audibles to the drift concept, look how Julio switches and puts his outside leg up instead of the inside, which is way more typical. He does this almost exclusively when he's running the drift, so he can cut on the correct foot and break at the right time. So then on the fake drift, look how his outside leg is again up, which helps totally confound PJ Williams and the safety, who are completely fooled. 
Defenses still have to double Julio as much as possible whenever he's on the field, but it's one thing to be dangerous enough to command double teams, which create opportunities for others, but it's another to actually be able to beat them. There are a few ways to double a receiver, one of which is what defenses call a cone bracket, where the corner is positioned lower to take away anything low and outside or play through the low hip on a corner route, and the safety plays higher and is ready to trigger on anything low and inside while playing the post or deep over with leverage. Julio knows the best way to beat these cone brackets is to find the one-on-one -on -one within the double team. He knows if he attacks Cam Dantzler and beats him outside, there's nobody there. But if he tries the same thing inside, Harrison Smith has better leverage and more depth on him. It just won't work. So he tears up field directly at Dantzler to freeze him in place, then makes contact to create space at the top of the route and easily separates for a touchdown. If he's beating up double teams, there's nothing the defense really can do except for just keep doubling him, which would be a major asset to any team if he does get traded. And, on top of attracting extra attention, if there's a challenging route that needs to be run, Julio can still run any route in the book. The Broncos are using a similar cone bracket on him at the bottom, and the Falcons are running a double post concept to take advantage of the vacated middle of the field. The route progression is inside post to outside post to check down, and watch Russell Gage run his widened post breaking on the seventh step which comes free, but cornerback Michael O.J. Mudia gets aggressive and jumps the route, and also Ryan kind under throws it. But then a quarter later, it's time to bring in the hired gun. In a similar spot on the field nearing the high red zone, the Falcons use their base personnel and a formation with both receivers on one side of the field to make it more difficult for the Broncos to double Julio. And instead of the double post concept, they show something nearly identical, but Julio reverses out on a blaze out and gets wide ass open. It's no mistake that this is again against OJ Mudia, who they saw had gotten a little jumpy last time. And again, the route's broken off on the seventh step. Julio sprints at OJ Mudia to break his cushion, and after smoothly transitioning into his cut, watch OJ Mudia's eyes. They start on Julio, but after he sees him break and he sees his entire body, feet, hips, shoulders, and eyes turn to the post, he's ready to jump the route he thinks he knows is coming and switches his eyes to the quarterback. This is vintage Julio. He's got the same hip fluidity, the same ability to snap down and burst out of his cuts, and still crosses up defenders anytime, anywhere. When he is actually given the luxury of a one-on-one -on -one matchup, he downright terrorizes those poor isolated defenders. Generally, as receivers get older, they lose some of their speed and quickness, and to get to the right spot on time, they start to cheat in their routes to account for that loss of speed. But Julio's still able to make all of his routes look exactly the same and can break them off at any moment. Take this example against the Seahawks, where the corner Quinton Dunbar is playing off coverage in a deep third zone. The Falcons ran a ton of dagger, which is a deep cross or seam with a dig route, so since Dunbar is in his deep third, which is outside leveraged, he'll have to be a little more aggressive to play the dig. Julio knows this, and he uses it to his advantage. He always wants the corner to think he's running a deep go route, then he breaks his routes off from that, so he always starts with his head down and arms pumping to threaten the corner deep, especially when they're way off. Dunbar starts to get a little twitchy when he sees Ridley angling inside because it looks like dagger, so he begins to drift toward the dig as he's pedaling backwards while maintaining his outside leverage technique with his butt to the sideline. Right at the top of the stem, Julio instead begins to break the other way, and Dunbar's so fooled he speed turns in off coverage, which is the quicker way to get to a spot when you're completely fooled, but also calls for you to totally take your eyes off the receiver, which is dangerous. However, Julio's not running a corner, but a swirl route, and Dunbar's somewhere between Atlanta and Narnia by the time he makes the catch. No matter how you play him, he's gonna be productive, and even when you double him, any way you try and do it, it's just not gonna hold him back. One of the Saints' favorite ways to try and put two guys on him was to play cover two man, which is man coverage with a deep safety over the top, but there's a slight difference when playing this specific coverage. The corner plays inside leverage to try and funnel the receiver to that safety, and so he'll trail inside and underneath and lean on his safety to do the rest. In-breaking routes are the hardest to win on since the corner is sitting underneath you and playing through your low hip, but no matter how much the Saints ran it, they couldn't stop Julio. Watch him hesitate in his release to get Patrick Robinson to shoot his hands, then Julio swats his arm away. But notice how Robinson doesn't try and restack over the top, but stays underneath and inside in his trail. Julio knows his eyes are just as important as his body, 
so he gives a high mom look at the camera to fool Robinson and the safety, then breaks back inside for a big gain. Whichever team he ends up playing for this season, he's gonna go there and absolutely dominate. And while last year some of his numbers slipped due to injuries, he still shows the same quickness, smarts, fluid route running, and physicality that have made him an elite player for the past decade. He'll be of value to any team for so many reasons, whether it's frequently commanding double teams and still beating those double teams, high-end production, and being the type of guy who can elevate an offense to new heights. He's developed so many tools that he's refined over his career. As time has gone on, he's been able to change and modify his game like so many older, great receivers have also done in the past. Julio Quintoris Lopez Jones is still a difference maker and a terror to cover all over the field. He is a championship caliber player for any championship caliber team. If his time is up in Atlanta, there's still plenty of time left in his career. Whenever this guy's on the field, all eyes in the stadium are on him. And young or old, nothing will slow him down.